Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for Orda for inviting me. Yes, I'm a recorder player. That's not a surprise. Uh, next to recorder, I also play iwi. That's an electronic wind instrument. And I also make music theater, a lot with improvisation, with jazz musicians and uh, dancers. And I also compose and arrange music. So for me, improvisation is almost a career choice. And uh, that's also why it's really important to me, the subject, as well as in teaching. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things. I will tell a little story of why I became interested in teaching improvisation or implementing improvisation in my teaching practice. Um, I also designed a course material related to this teaching improvisation for kids. I will walk you through a couple of examples from that. Then I would like to take a moment to talk about why improvisation can be really important and essential uh, really for, um, for the next generation. And um, as a closing, I will just uh, bring up a couple of professional examples, people who are improvising uh, on the recorder. And just to make it clear in advance, when I say improvisation, for, um, I'm going to focus specifically on free improvisation, atonal improvisation, as uh, the keynote speaker says, genre-free improvisation. So uh, my turf is not going to be related to early music, but just to give you a context. So that's how you should understand what I'm talking about. So, uh, the story for me starts uh, around 12 years ago, when I was still in high school, but I was preparing to enter the conservatory, this conservatory, in fact. And, um, but I, I got an opportunity to replace one of my former, former teachers uh, at the music school. And I had zero experience, of course, and I was really excited to, to take over her teaching uh, for the afternoon. So I went there, and I entered the room. And the first student arrived, and she put the score, and she put the instrument together. She was about to start playing, but, um, but I just wanted to set her at ease. So I, I asked her, oh, before you start, can you just please play something? And she looked at me, but what? <laughs> and uh, that was for me really traumatic, as well as it was for her, I guess. <laughs> and yeah, so that, that really got me thinking, why is it that, um, that so often kids are not daring to play just something? We educate them very often to play what's in the score. You learn fingering, you learn what that looks like on this really abstract sheet of paper, and, and you start mapping out your knowledge base on that. So I thought, how could, how could I come up with some methods, some ideas to, to break away from that? And then later on, when I entered conservatory here, uh, I based my methodic subject, which was a two years research, um, teaching improvisation for groups. And I was lucky enough to get the chance to, to teach this at a summer course in Hungary. And I also did this a couple of times in, uh, in here in Amsterdam. So it's a it's try out. <laughs> and, um, and so I will show you now a couple of examples from that. Um, also a little more context. So I meant it for mixed instrumentalists. Although it's of course possible only on the recorder. But I think you get to much more exciting musical results if you can get children with different instruments into the room. And also, these exercises are, they do require some prior musical knowledge, so I designed it and meant it for, <coughs> let's say, if you have played your instrument already for two, three years, and you have a little bit of something going, let's say from the age of 10 and upwards. So, <coughs> the first exercise. Oh yeah, uh, something in addition. These things are for me, kind of in between steps. Uh, these are meant to break these boundaries. For example, when it comes to score, or when it comes to a conductor, or, or other types of fears. Um, but what I think ultimately can come out of it is really free improvisation. When, when you have gone through a couple of exercises and you experience some different things, and, and these are all just in between. This is part of the process. Not that there needs to be a specific result, but that these are, these are just part of a larger story. So, um, this uh, exercise directly deals with uh, how to get away from the score. Um, I took inspiration from a book, uh, which is uh, for visual education, in fact. And there, a um, professor from Hungary uh, talks about breaking down drawing or painting into three really simple building blocks. That is dot and patch and line. Oh, the whiteboard is far away, but I can. <laughs> so, um, so, we can get the uh, kids together on a big sheet of paper in the middle. 
And let's just start drawing with only these three uh, really simple elements. Like draw some dots, some patches, some lines. And then let's see how can we interpret this on our instruments. So could you play um, a dot-like note on your instrument? How would that sound like? Or what is a line on your instrument? Etc. Etc. And where it gets um, exciting, or even more exciting, is when, um, when we start looking at these elements, also how they relate, relate to each other. For example, if I start drawing a bunch of dots, but that ultimately forms a line, where, where do these boundaries lie? Or this patch, it's also a bunch of lines actually, but they also form something else. So all this discussion can occur around the table with the kids, and these are two paintings, sorry, drawings, uh, that, uh, that some of the kids made in uh, one of these courses. And, uh, and then we just interpret it on our instruments. And uh, where it also gets uh, even, even, even more exciting is um, to separate the group into two parts, for example, and then both groups make their own score. They come up with an inter interpretation. We can perform it for each other. But then they also swap score, and they have to make up their minds <coughs> about the other group's drawing. So that then you can have all kinds of really wonderful and exciting conversation about why did you play that patch, that line, the way you did? And what could be another option for that? And you can see where I'm going with this. So this opens up, I think, a lot of doors. And we are still dealing with a piece of paper, so there's a guideline. But this can help you get away from the sheet music type notation and get into almost graphic notation. But it doesn't have to be the complicated contemporary type. Once again, this is for this age group. Uh, you can go more crazy when you have a bit older kids or that are more advanced on their instruments. It can also be that you involve examples of graphic notation of modern pieces that you can still break away from the just a normal uh, violin key, et cetera, et cetera. This was one thing. Oh, I'm doing pretty good on time so far. <laughs> the next one is about conductor. Um, I genuinely, I don't like so much music that is conducted. I think that, um, I know that there are institutions that work like that, but it feels really like a pyramid down. There is one guy that decides and everybody else obeys those rules. And, and this is, um, yeah, it just feels, it feels really uninspiring to be in no way in the artistic decision making when you're just part of the group and there is this top down version. And I can imagine that sometimes for children that can be also a bit Weird, there is the, uh, the conductor in the children's group will always be a teacher or somebody older and somebody with authority, but could you maybe, you know, could we not swap these roles? Could we not break out of it? So this exercise I would like to try with you in fact. This is from a course picture uh, a couple of years ago in Hungary. So this conductor game goes in a way that uh, we get one of the kids. I will be the kid. And I will assign to each of you one of my body parts and you will make music when I move that body part. So just, you can pick an instrument, you can tap or, <laughs> or something, just make up your mind. You will be my hand, my right, oh, whole arm. Sarah, could you be my left arm, please? Could you be my foot? Uh, could you be my other foot? Um, fingers? This one? Uh, other fingers? Yeah. Um, head for the female speaker. <laughs> and uh, could you be my eyes? All right. Here we go. that always comes in handy when you have a longer lesson and the kids are just going nuts so you want to you know, break it. Of course it's best if you rotate all the roles if there are different instruments maybe instruments that everybody can play like drums or piano then you can also rotate these parts and um, yeah so to not be afraid to lead but also not be afraid to follow. Often when you do this exercise a couple of times uh, the people who are one and the other foot also kind of form a sub-entity, or for the fingers, or for the arms. So that's also nice that these kind of little smaller groups that form all together a bigger group um, just occur naturally. So this is also lots of fun to do. 
that there was a lot of mention of game and playing. I said now exercise and um, of course these are all valid terms and anyway these are free for interpretation. But I thought that maybe play is even better of a word than game. And here is why. Because in a game, if you think about a game like a sports game or a board game, then you can have, you always have a set of rules. But in a play you can just Freely, free, freely explore. Or in a game, there is often focus on the result, who wins, for example, or what happens. And in a play, you're focusing on the process. In a game, you often have winners and losers, as I just said, but if you're playing, there is no such thing, in fact. In a game, now this is a sports term, that there is somebody, referee, a conductor, or etc., etc. But in a play, rules can be invented by all players which of course is something that was mentioned also across that we play a game where the rules are invented by all players. So of course this is not a white, black and white thing, what I'm trying to say, but it's good to, good to think about all of these different elements and how we treat them and what we expect from the kids also. And I think, yeah, this expectation is by itself already something um, quite crucial. Why do we have to expect something, especially in free improv? Um, yeah, there is no right or wrong. There is no failure as such thing. Of course, you have to get there, and that's a, uh, why I was saying all the all these examples. And um, uh, yes, I have uh, some more exercises in this method book that I designed. So when we are sharing videos and uh, contacts, I'm happy to give you some more uh, information about that if you're interested. It's explaining more detail. And um, for me, the crucial part about all of this is basically what do we want from the next generation. I think we want them to have critical thinking, not to just accept whatever comes their way. We want to develop creativity, spontaneity, freedom of expression. Uh, to function well in a group, you have to be able to communicate and share feelings with the others. I find improvisation as such has a strong emphasis on choice, and I would even like to go as far as saying that this is incredibly important right now if you think about the political climate that we are in. So many things happened where people made a choice not really knowing what the choice that they made and that has severe political effects which affect all of our lives. And, um, and, I think, and also if you think about the environment <laughs> that a lot of people walk into a supermarket and just they take whatever they saw on the television. You don't want that. We, I don't think we want that. What we want is people who make actual conscious choices and, uh, and can decide for themselves and think like that. And through improvisation, I really, really think that we can encourage that type of mental capacity, that kind of behavior for the next generation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know. This was the emotional <laughs> ending of my... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, great. <laughs> Last but not least, um, yeah, I think it would be a great shame, which also happens sometimes, that, um, that a kid maybe plays a recorder and would like to do a bit more with that, but then, but then he or she feels like that the recorder is not really an instrument where he can improvise, and maybe he picks up a clarinet because there he can go to jazz or something cool or saxophone, whatever. Um, but I think that's, that's also partially due to the fact because maybe as a recorder community we don't uh, look enough into examples that are actually there in the field of improvised music, but there is also not that many, but there are some. So I think it's also our mission to inspire children with existing musical examples and show them that the recorder is also capable of playing all kinds of different genres besides uh, Renaissance, Medieval, Baroque and uh, Classical Contemporary music. There are players who improvise and it would be great if we can support that community as well. And um, here are just a couple of examples. Talia Rubinstein, who is going to play tonight. Uh, I think it's worth checking out her music. Uh, Kim Josephine Bodem, who was in fact the artist in residence at the German festival last year, a German jazz festival, where also the recorder was previously unheard of. So this is a wonderful example. Please check out her work. 
I happened to play with her on the festival, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> Angelica Castello, who has a wonderful tentet, so tentet. And uh, <laughs> she lives in Vienna, but she comes from Mexico. A uh, wonderful player as well. Silvia Hens was here earlier. She has a really um, interesting and wonderful projects also in this direction of free improvisation. And I'm not here to praise myself, but I would like to mention myself as well. <laughs> so I hope you forgive me for that. Yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> with the situation that, that uh, uh, the child uh, plays something like a, maybe a dot mm -hmm. and, and then everybody else is um, playing a chart and one, one plays it long or something like this. Okay. Uh, that, that one plays it like a long note, for example, and everybody else is playing it like a short note. Mm -hmm. like, like, how do you say that it's wrong, or is it wrong? Yes, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, in my experience, actually, it kind of, if you let that happen for a little while, kids kind of find each other, what the communal dot is like today. You know, it can also be different for a different group. I don't really say wrong, right, because, it, because I really think that, that, for me, it didn't occur a lot. If I said, okay, let's play dot, 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 Everybody starts playing dot, and of course there are different sizes, so to say, but sooner or later the group tends to agree on one way of playing that. So every, you know, kind of a naturally occurring compromise. And um, yeah, that, that's pretty much my answer. <laughs> I have a question. How does the recorder fit into the wider free improvisation scene, like with other instruments? Yeah. Is it accepted or...? It's a bit difficult in my experience because, you know, recorder has already um, quite a dif difficult role inside the classical music. If you talk, think about the total of classical music, we're still fighting for our existence. Uh, in the jazz, it's, uh, jazz world, it's even more weird because, uh, yeah, it doesn't have a, a historical background. But at the same time, it's also really free because it's like, oh, just another instrument, a color that we have never heard. Uh, why not? Uh, so I face these two um, situations most of the time. Um, also, uh, wait, I had I had something important to say. <laughs> um, yeah, the only uh, thing where it gets a bit tricky is uh, is amplification, to be honest, because a lot of the times uh, um, free improv that develops from the field of jazz is loud instruments, often with a drum set. So. Volume is something that you that I find myself often to fight for, or really open a conversation about. Hey guys, I know it's weird, but I have this instrument, and this is my acoustic limit. So, if you want to play with me, deal with it, please. <laughs> so yeah, I think this is just something that you have to often mention in conversation, and um, and that's how it can get better. Thank you so much.